So I titled my talk Making. So I'll be talking how how I work in making and at Snowheda and personal work and all that. So I just I put in the slide in here. It's a view of the shop at Rafael Vignoli Architects, where I interned after my second year at Syracuse. And I learned a lot techniques and skills while in their shop and kind of freelanced while intern while in school and then did a little bit of work after I graduated working there. And I learned a lot of techniques from the guys in there and all that, that I've used and developed through the years. So I'll show a few images of kind of different scales of projects that I've worked on before I start in, in depth describing other, other work. So this is a 3D printed spiral stairs that I put in a earring hook and just created a little earring. And you can tell the scale by the mechanical pencil that it's attached to. Then this, this came out, wait, it's actually in my pocket. <laughs> so I have this little thing, right? I brought it with me. Last weekend I was demonstrating to a friend how, how, to, how the foam cutter works. So it created this cool shape and I thought, why don't I cast it out of concrete? And then it kind of looked like a pavilion in different forms, similar to the, the installation on Market Street that Daron and a couple other people worked on. This is the, the doorknob. So at Snowheda, we had, a, in the previous office, we had a, a door that was about eight foot by eight foot. And it didn't have a, it didn't have a doorknob, so we had a little a suggestion box where one of the suggestions was to build a doorknob for our door, and someone suggested, I think Craig Dykers, the founder, suggested it, sh it should be a hand. So I cast it since my hand is a little too big for a doorknob. I cast it a coworker's hand, and with a bolt in it, and then bolted it to this big door. So we had a door to to the, I mean the doorknob to the door. And this is just from the mold that, the rubber mold where the, the resin was casted. Also did a concrete one. After I casted that little, the other piece, there was leftover rockite, so I just poured this little thing, just brought it to show. This is a, a study of a form for a TV set. It's all out of blue foam, insulation foam, so it's about six inches tall. And it was to test kind of the pivoting and an operable idea that th this TV set had for apartment renovation. These at, at Snowheda, we had a lot of, of leftover sawhorses. So these weird sawhorse profiles that I, I didn't think they had any use for building other models. So I decided, well, why don't I just try gluing them all together and created this stump with the, the profile, the L profiles of the, of the sawhorses. This was, this is a scale model of an installation that friends and I did for Governor's Island Pavilion in 2014. So we built this little scale model. It was called Urban Accordion because it's meant to fluctuate based on different events for a summer and on Governor's Island. It was a finalist, but it, it didn't win because the I think the critics were afraid this operable idea would not work very well. And so it just went out. This was the farthest it went. This is an example of how at, at Snowheda we, we built for a concept phase of a project. So this is a library project where the whole team kind of gets together and we build these different concept models, testing different ideas to arrive at a certain form that we want to pursue for the project and develop. So there's different materials. There's a lot of foam models, but there's some wood and then some museum board testing different ideas. This is a, a model that's part of the MoMA Museum of Modern Art New York collection that I did while in Syracuse with a friend where it, the house was designed by Marcel Breuer for disaster housing in 1940s. And we replicated this model for a prefabrication exhibit at, at MoMA in New York. 
So the floor, the, the ground was milled out of layered pieces of plywood. And then the footers and the steps were cast concrete, similar, same type of material as these things. And then the rest was just kind of veneer plywood. This is another model of the Volkswagen factory in Dresden. It was built for a vertical, a vertical urban factory exhibition. And the first exhibition was at the Skyscraper Museum in New York. And now it's currently in Lausanne, Switzerland, about the same idea with also displaying factories from Switzerland. So it's traveling around. It's all made of plexi and kind of styrene and stacked materials. So those were some examples. And now I just want to talk about how I went from, uh, from Syracuse University to starting at Snowheda. So in my fourth year abroad in, in New York, we, we had a New York program. It was the first semester in New York that Syracuse had. And I, this was my desk in that studio. It was a small studio, only about 10 students. And this was my little corner. I built a lot of models for the project. And this is kind of all of them together towards the end of the semester. And our project was to find program for the empty space in downtown Manhattan after the financial crash. So this was in spring of 2009. So my, my proposal was to put, a, to kind of design a horizontal, horizontal town vertically in a tower. So I took this Chase Bank tower, the middle portion of it, since the middle is usually not occupied when tenants move out, and cut through floor plates and kind of designed this tower. This is a, after that semester, that summer, I interned at Snowheda for a little bit and worked on this model of, a few models, this was one of them, of the James Hunt Library for North Carolina State University. And we used this model to test different facade options and kind of glazing and all that, and the different lighting effects that were created by the fins in the, in, in the project. Then with, this is on a project after I started full-time at Snowheda. This is an example of a project. And I wanted to describe how we work at Snowheda with this, with this, with this project. So, this was a competition for, for a waterfront center in Belgrade, Serbia. And when we start a competition, usually we gather as a, as a large group, sometimes the whole office, sometimes a big group of people interested, and we kind of describe the, the, the brief of the competition. And then together we design, we have this long table, we kind of get together and split into groups and design different proposals for just to kind of get ideas out as a group. So for this, after the charrette we had together, there are examples of models like this came out. The top one, which is very just basic trace with programming all over it, testing different ideas of circulation and stuff like that. And then the bottom, where it's more landscape landform of cutting the surface to create a, a surface on top of the site. Then as we kept going through a project, we worked with program blocks and kind of spacing and kept doing study models to develop the project. And then when we find a, uh, an idea that we want to continue, so for this, it was these pentagonal forms that create a space underneath the building and on top and an occupiable roofscape. So we continued and developed that, so built models such as these, kind of developing the idea where from, from, one, from one side you climb up and you're kind of on a second level throughout the building, slowly sloped. And, and then ended up, this was the final scheme that was developed into renderings and all that of this, this waterfront center. Uh, kind of on opposite end of that, very different from the previous project, this was an existing, an existing Snowheda building that we built a model of the Oslo Opera House as a, that was given to MoMA New York to be part of their collection. And this was kind of the condition of the shop with all the formwork and everything that we used to build this model. And 
and each each facet of of the of the project was modeled and kind of foam cut in these different blue foam forms, and then we applied a plywood layer over it, and then after that etched all the stonework of the project and applied that on top, similar in, in this manner, and then even had a water portion that had a little fade into it, demonstrating how the project act works. And then we painted it all and glued it all together, and this was the result. These are just final photographer models of what it looked like. And then in this one, you can see the stonework slightly in there, how it was slightly visible. You'd have to get close to the model to see it. And the model is currently on exhibit at MoMA, at part of their Making Music Modern exhibit. That is up through the end of the year, through October. And it's amongst th these instruments and kind of musical, musical devices. And you have this one architecture model since it's an opera house and it's about music. And, uh, a small scale project at Snowheda is the dollhouse, the Bloomsbury doll dollhouse. And this is a top view of it looking through the roof into, uh, into the sp spiral like staircase. And this is the overall view of the house. So it looks kind of very traditional, very almost folk like. And as we started the project, we wanted to create kind of this operable idea where it wasn't just a static dollhouse, typical dollhouse. So we built all these little study models, testing ideas of pivoting and kind of hinging. And this is a video of how it worked. Yeah, there it is. So it, it pivots in the middle and then hinges on, on two sides, on here, on the back, and then pivots in the middle. So that was a, a little study model of that. And then on the scale of the dollhouse, we started testing the shingles and kind of the structure and all that. All this was modeled in Rhino and then kind of translated into 3D, in, into laser cut templates that we would assemble together. And then we assemble, after figuring out through, large, through the museum board models, we used the thin plywood to, to build a final thing. So this is the roof structure. And then the shingles were applied onto it with the curve of the roof structure. And then this is the inside of the upper level. So we tested out furniture and kind of flooring and all that. The hinging method was we tried as much as we can to conceal the hinge in, in the dollhouse. And this was a spiral staircase that led from level one to level two of the house. The, this is the lower level, so the flooring on the lower level, you, have, you had kind of the basic kitchen, bathroom, and, and the bedroom. And while the, t the upper level was more of an attic and open space, so on this, we mix the flooring of each, each type from each room instead of having to end on a hard line. This is a closer up view. So this is tiling that was bought from a dollhouse store. So it's all to dollhouse scale. It's not printed flat. It has actual depth and all that. And all the wood pattern is also to the scale of a dollhouse. Then above that, we added kind of the roof level of the roof of the level one. And we put a landscape component with a, this, this piano wire tree through it. And this kind of wavy pattern creating diff for different skylights. So all these little things were dichroic plexi that created skylights on the bottom when light shined through when the house was opened. And this, this is a, this is just how that, it worked in the final product. So it's for the lower level. You, there's someone behind it operating it, so it's not a, it's not it's it's not an automatic thing. Someone's hiding behind it, opening it. So this is the bottom level. And then the, the upper level. So the hint, the. Pivots are in the center here, and then the hinges are concealed in there. And 
the hinges were had a little angle just so we create a stop point when the model opened. As you can tell in there. Because if it kept opening, it would break from opening one at 180 degrees. And then this was the final dollhouse, which was on exhibit. And you can see it's all decorated on the top with, with the planting and all that and some furniture. And then the lower level where you have the basic rooms with all the fixtures and appliances. The, all the furniture was, was bought from a dollhouse store. And not, it wasn't built well, wallpaper and everything else. Everything that's not furniture was, was built while all the, everything else was. So we didn't, we didn't build all the little fireplace and stuff like that. And then we even had a little mouse hole with a mouse trap and a mouse inside. Now I'm just going to show other work I've done. So this, with artist Marion Wilson, I, we worked on Marion paints on these small, small glass, recycled glass slides. And we thought, why don't we create kind of art shipping crates on a small scale for small art, kind of refle uh, reflecting the idea of the full scale large, for large pieces of art, the way they get transported. So these paintings were really small and kind of had these lids that pulled in and out to create these, and with foam spacers inside to store the paintings. And working from that same idea, we thought, why don't we display the paintings on the lids so you have a storage of paintings inside, and you can switch them in and out and display them on, onto this lid, so more as a display piece. And then further taking that where this is sort of an accordion form with, with uh, frames that allow you to stick, stick the paintings through it and splay it out and open it to, to display it in different methods. This is a a bench that I designed for a gallery in New York City. And these, these models are about two inches big, which I carried in my pocket, similar, similar to these, to show the, the gallery owner what ideas I was having for it. And then as he agreed, he, he, he said just to keep developing the idea. And we built a larger scale model, testing the angles, kind of the form of the bench. So the form had two positions where this was the exterior version and the interior version, so flipped based on where you were displaying it, either in the gallery or outside. And when, before we started building the final thing, we built full-scale mock-up out of foam core just to test the size and, and height of it and all that. And then started building an actual thing out of plywood. And it was this basic Z form, or zigzag form. And then lined, each of the exposed edges of the plywood were lined with painted oak, white oak. And then from the client's request, he wanted it to be pink. So we cut this plywood on an angle that was added on top and painted pink. And then in the indoor version, you were able to store books and kind of use it as, for storage. So the, the top is the outdoor version and the the lower one is the indoor version. The outdoor version had a slight angle to match the sidewalk of, the, of this neighborhood it was in in New York City. So it, you were able to sit upright instead of angling when you sat on the bench. And it's just a close-up of the detail of it. It's a construction. This was it installed in the gallery on the inside. And then on the outside where it fits with the angle of the sidewalk. Similar idea as the previous bench was for this urban rest stop in project in Syracuse, but sim simplifying the idea a lot was just using two basic L shapes that sat on top of each other, one for structure and one for seating. And, and these benches were all painted to waterproof them since they were for outdoor installation. And this was our assembly line where we we had to make 48 of these benches. So we had this outdoor, outdoor setup where we chopped everything and painted and primed and all that. 
And this is how we, we store them on the dry racks to dry. And then we had a little jig, which made it easier to glue them all, to, to screw them all on the right angle. And this was all the benches laid out on, on the site. Not on the site of the project, but after they were assembled. Just another view of the back of them. And then some of them, they, all, they were able to fit together and kind of create these different conditions. Then we stored them like this on pallets and piled them up and shipped them to the site of the project. So these were built in, in Pennsylvania and they were shipped to Syracuse to be installed. And then this is us installing them in Syracuse along with the rest of the installation. Some of them were laid out in front of this large inflatable screen to be so people can sit down and watch sort of like a theater. And then some kids even use them to play around, play fort. And, uh, another project is, this was with a group of Bulgarians for the Queens Museum of Art in New York. The Queens Museum went through a renovation about a year and a half ago and expanded. So we proposed this with a group of Bulgarian artists to build this house that was used out of the scrap materials from their construction. So each wall was a different artist, represented a different artist, even inside. So each surface of the, of the house was given to a different Bulgarian in the group. This is just a model of the house that we used to send. We gave to we showed the museum to kind of demonstrate the project and the size of it and all that. It had a shelf for books and a shelf for kind of jars and bottles. And some of the shelves pulled out. They were meant to be brought into the community and collect books. And this is, this is an image of how we, we were building all the components of the house out of either leftovers from the demo or leftovers from the construction of the, of the museum. We worked while there were people building the actual museum. We were building this little house inside the space. The shelf, we added the shelf wall and then started cladding the inside. So it's a basic house, but it was all hinged on these hinges. That's how it was held together. And then this is just a view of how the house was in the middle of the construction. So you can see the, the museum is being constructed while we're constructing this thing. Then this was what it finally looked like when all the artists added their pieces. So there's the jar wall here, which the, the artist gave. She, she sang folk music, Bulgarian folk music. So some of the images in the jars are from those workshops and also did pickling workshops where she would teach people how to pickle vegetables and different things. And then the, this was the book wall where people were allowed to trade a museum manual for a book on an international language to kind of create this international library that would be donated to a public library. And then another wall was one of the artists designed this customs form similar to when you're traveling to another country where she had a workshop with people drawing plants that they weren't able to bring from their home country or another country and kind of illustrating that and creating this map of the world's the world's fair site which is where the museum is located in Flushing Meadow Park and then the inside one one of the artists is um a DJ he the whole theme of the house was smuggle tactics, so kind of smuggling plants, smuggling books. So he encouraged people to charge their phones, and then he would steal your music and then use it to throw a party, which he would DJ out, out of the house. And then the last group was two, two artists who fly drones around and kind of record footage. So they flew the drone around the World's Fair site, which is the big park around the museum, and then projected it inside the house on this kind of old TV. And the drone was displayed on top of the house. This is just the house inside the museum with, in the context of the museum. It was in the middle of this large 
really tall space. It used to be the museum, this part of the museum used to be ice skating rink, which was converted to a museum. Then in this last part I just wanted to discuss is to show work I've done on my apartment the past year and a half. And a friend of mine did a little piece about it on shelter.com, which you guys can see if anyone's interested about their apartment. And so one of the pieces for the apartment was this table, this coffee table. And from renovating the apartment and kind of, I thought, what can I do with the scraps, scrap wood flooring, scrap from different things I built? So I thought, why don't I just glue them together and create a table, create a piece of furniture. So this is how I clamped them slowly, layer after layer. And then this, is what, this was the result. So each the, each, the long way, none of the materials touched. It was left with a gap in between. This is a close-up view. So there are different types of wood from plywood, oak. There's even Canadian beetle woods, wood that was infested by beetles which I found the scrap of. And then, and then I filled in, every hole was filled in with almost every hole. There's a couple of blank ones. We're filled with white resin, clear resin, and rock eye concrete, this material, to, to fill in the gaps and create a just solid table. Just another view of it. And the underside was left very uneven, so the top was nice and smooth while the bottom was left jagged. And, uh, another, Daron mentioned uh, making things out of food. This is the Chibani. I, I eat Chibani, I guess, every morning, and I decided to save the cups and why not use them for a light fixture. If you saw in the beginning, you know, there was a, in the studio, my little studio desk, there was a, a sculpture started out of coffee cups. So I, I thought if I collect enough of these, I can create an actual light fixture. So this is how they were assembled together, pre-drilled holes, all about six holes per cup, and then they're all bolted with these uh, fasteners together. And then this is how it looks like in the space. The first attempt was in the back where it's a little more lanky and less rigid, while the second attempt was, was uh, a little more organized and the fasteners were, were smaller, so it allowed it to be more compact. And it, it just uses a I IKEA fixture where it was added onto it. And this is a close up of it. One of the rooms in the apartment had these little nooks that after renovating the apartment, there wasn't much book storage for books, so I thought I, I need to make some shelves. So right now the, book, the books were on the floor, laid out on the floor. And instead of from redoing all the flooring in the apartment, I had a lot of leftover wood. So I thought, why don't I, it would, be a, it would take a lot longer why don't I try just to glue all these pieces of wood together to create these planks instead of purchasing wood since, since th there were wood flooring lying around. So I glued them together and then assembled it in this way. And then this was the shelf in the end. So this is a, look, a view looking up at it. So this is the unfinished part of the flooring that gets adhered to the ground. And then the upper part of it, which is stained and finished. And then this is the overall, and to test, to make sure it stays up on the wall, I climbed it and kind of shook it around a little to make sure. So that was my structural test for the shelf before putting all the books on it. And then this is when the books were all added to it. And a closer up view of it, so have models and books all displayed on it. And this little shallow shelf over here has, has uh, has a, on, on the edge of it, which you can't see to the left, also built this little stair out of laser cut plexi and little scale figures. And that's it. Uh, thank you.
questions or <laughs> The question was, where do I have the space to build all my stuff? Well, for the apartment, I, I bought a I have a table saw in the basement, kind of use stuff there. And then we have a small shop at Snow Hider, so some, th some stuff is built there. And I'm wondering if you can describe your, um, your process. You, you did a lot of it when you were describing the table in your in your uh, living room. But I'm wondering, particularly for your own things, that. Uh, that are all about you. Is there a process that you can describe? Is it all physical? Is it a um, all with sort of the the real the real things, or do you incorporate a lot of drawing as you determine how you're going to create something? And pr I think particularly related to your own design. Well, for this. The apartment stuff, I used, that was basically an experiment, so there wasn't much planning. I just thought, just glue it together and try it out. So it's more of a prototype. I see the apartment as an experiment and kind of trying stuff out. But for, for more project work for that, a lot of the time there's a rhino model or draw rhino, something, a curve in rhino and then print that out, cut it out and try it, test out forms. And sometimes it's hard to just sketch or draw a form manually when it's you can draw it and test it out in in a, in a program in, in CAD or Rhino and then cut it out. Uh, you were talking about the gallery space or an urban gallery inside SF MoMA um, and you had mentioned that there was glass uh, inserted in there to prevent the travel of smoke. Did Was the main goal of the project to make it one open cohesive area, area but then like the codes came into the project and you had to make modifications? Yeah, yeah. It's the spa we wanted the space to be large and open so you, you kind of have connection between each staircase and you can tell that's a, a circulation space and then views out to the city as well as you're walking through it with all the glaze openings throughout that facade. And the smoking glass for smoking, all that was part of the code and as the project was developed, we had to kind of follow those rules. Naturally, of course. Very cool. Thank you. All right, Mario, I got a question for you. So you've been, you've been describing these projects as kind of, there's, there's clearly a love of making. Um, and there's, there's almost an innocence. You're like, I don't know, I just glued it together to see what happened. So on the one hand, you have this deep knowledge of how things work, of, of how you can assemble them. We saw stuff, everything from a Chibani cup and finding the fasteners to that to advanced uh, digital fabrication techniques that you're using at work. How do you, what's the, and this is kind of touching up on what Jennifer said, how do you do that, how do you navigate that, uh, that world between the innocence of play and making versus the exactness of what material, why, why do it out of rockite? I know you, you kind of made this, this thing, um, this air of, I don't know, I just had some rockite left over, but we all have material all the time. So what, what compels you to see a material and to think, I need to make something with this? Well, sometimes it's the idea, the concept you want to show, so think about what material is the best for that. And I guess for, an ex as an example, some things are learned from previous things. So for the dollhouse, the fasteners that were used on the Chibani cups were also used on the dollhouse pivot method in the middle to allow it to open. And after using that on that house, I thought, why don't I just use these and create a light fixture as a fastener? Because it's always hard to glue the, all the cups together. And just, and I don't know, a lot of it is trial. Let's see how we can rep represent this. So for examples like SF MoMA facade, there, there was a lot of question, how do we represent these ripples? We did different study models out of plastic, out of, and then the end method that was best was just gluing this, these flat strips onto a surface, created the best effect when light was shining on it and all that. Favorite material to work with? Favorite material? Or architectural know. models? I think it depends on the kind of project, so 
Sometimes it's it's wood. Other times, if it's a crazier shape, I like using insulation foam. While other times, solid plexi d depends on the material. Uh, depends on the project. D depends on what the design is. And always evaluate what, based on what the project is, what material is right for that. I'm curious who commissions Snowhead up for a dollhouse. <laughs> I knew that question was coming up. Um, the you, you guys probably noticed some the flooring didn't match from the first image that I don't know if you guys noticed, but we did we made two dollhouses. The first one was donated, so it was, it was a pro bono project. It was donated to a, hos a children's hospital in Texas as a fundraiser for an auction they were having, and and then the second one we made to have exhibited, and then SF moment, it was displayed at the office for a while, and then about it. Six months later, SF MoMA auctioned it off for another fundraiser here in San Francisco. So they're both purchased by somebody for, for their grandchildren, children. So it wasn't a commission, it was more of we wanted to do it. <laughs> um, where is Snowheda? Well, Snowheda is named after the, the place Snowheda is a mountain in Norway. So it's named after a mountain in Norway. And in central Norway, and the uh, the the office started in Oslo, so that we have an office in Oslo, we have an office in New York, and studio a studio in San Francisco, and and one in in Austria. Are you here as part of a team for Mar Market Street prototyping? No, I I I, would, <laughs> I didn't work. I think if I came a little earlier, I would have helped out with the Market Street, pro but I wasn't part of that. <laughs> Is anyone? So, Mario, thank you very much for, for coming out and for showing these guys the obsession of craft and how to always be making. So, thank you very much. Thank you for having me.